Als ich hier anfing, im Depot zu arbeiten, habe ich gedacht, okay, ich bin westlich ausgebildet und ich äh, glaube nicht mehr an, an die Seele und so weiter. Ja? Und dann äh, kam ich dann immer ins Depot und dann betrachte alles irgendwie wie, ein tote, wie tote Objekte. Und danach ist es mir auch nicht so ähm, gut gegangen, auch mit, äh, also körperlich. Also ich hatte Probleme und es ging mir auch immer schlechter und schlechter. Als ich in Indonesien war, habe ich einen spirituellen Lehrer gefragt. Und äh, er hat gesagt, ja, diese alten Objekte, ja, die haben auch ihre Seele. Also nicht nur die menschlichen Überreste, sondern auch äh, die Figuren und die äh, Waffen und so weiter. Ich muss mich auch selber schützen, weil diese äh, Energie, was da ausgestrahlt werden von den alten Objekten, sind nicht immer so gute Energie. Das heißt, und er hat mir dann ein... Ein, ähm, Hand, eine Handbewegung gezeigt, wie ich mich schütze. Und seitdem geht es mir besser. Das mag sehr lächerlich klingen, aber jeder Indonesier, der ins Depot geht, der hat immer so ein Gefühl, dass es auch, ein, auch irgendeine ein Seele gibt. Oder, also ich kann das nicht so äh, auf Deutsch erklären, weil das ist genau das Gegenteil. Teil von, von deutschen äh, äh, strukturellem Denken oder Aufklärung, aber es ist einfach äh, bei uns immer noch so, dass man denkt, okay, wie, es ist ein Spirit da und äh, wir müssen einfach mit diesem Spirit auch gut umgehen. Meine Kollegen ähm, wissen nicht, dass ich so ein Gefühl habe, und ähm, wenn ich sage, dass äh, die Indonesier immer sich auch unheimlich fühlen, wenn sie ins Depot gehen und so, dann haben sie natürlich gedacht, okay, ähm, das ist ein anderer Glaube und so weiter, weil als Europäer muss man ja auch vernünftig sein, man hat ja die Aufklärung hinter sich und, und so weiter. Ja? Das heißt, äh, ich bespreche das auch nicht mit meinen Kollegen, ja. Die, äh, an der anthropologischen Abteilung werden verschiedene Sammlungen verwahrt. Die größte Sammlung oder die umfangreichste Sammlung ist die sogenannte osteologische Sammlung, die Sammlung menschlicher Skelettreste. Diese Sammlung umfasst in etwa 40.000 äh, Individuen, die, sie, die ähm, aus äh, ganz unterschiedlichen Zeiten stammen und in ganz unterschiedlichen Kontexten erworben wurden. Die älteste oder der älteste Fundkomplex stammt aus einer Höhle in, in Meeren ist etwas mehr als 30.000 Jahre alt und hat eine Bedeutung für stammesgeschichtliche Fragestellungen. Und die sozusagen historisch oder zeitlich jüngste Kollektion stammt oder Kollektionen stammen aus dem 19. Jahrhundert. Hier finden wir vielleicht auch die ähm, stärksten ähm, diskutierten äh, Teile, Sammlungsteile, denn hier finden sich auch äh, eindeutig solche, die in Unrechtskontexten erworben wurden. One of the other issues to consider about scientific research and human remains in museum collections is the nature of collecting processes historically, which always reflected inequalities of power, whether the remains were coming from condemned criminals, executed criminals, which was certainly the practice in England at a certain point, or whether they were coming from indigenous peoples who were colonized and subject to inequities of power. In this country, it was a common practice for archaeologists conducting digs to take Boy Scouts out, kids out, school children out to these sites. So whole generations of children were raised with the notion that this is a legitimate operation, this act of desecrating Indian graves. It's not the same situation as exists, say, if you're excavating a churchyard in England, where it's your own people excavating their own ancestors and, and bringing out collections for archaeologists to study. There are inequities, often very severe ones, from the, from the very acquisition of these collections. I think that scientists are often reluctant to, to deal with those issues. They simply want to get the data, they want to work in the present. 
but these collections are not like other collections. There's no consent attached to them. There was often considerable dissent voiced at the moment of collections. And many people collected at night, many people collected uh, surreptitiously, because they knew the communities did not want this practice to happen. Placing their values of science, Western science, over our connection to our ancestors, depriving our ancestors and us of a right to a lasting burial. You know, a lot of non-Indians don't care if their remains end up in museums. Well, that's a personal preference. They have that right to make that decision. But for Indian people, we didn't have that right to say that it's okay for you to go into our graveyards and take the skulls of our fathers, our grandfathers, our grandmothers. This was done without their consent. If I wouldn't mind having my skull in such a collection, I don't think I would. Because to me, a skull, it's just material. It's just uh, like a piece of wood or... The spirit is no longer within the skull. The spirit is somewhere else. I'm gonna keep watching from over there. But the skull, to me, it, it doesn't have any, uh, any meaning or... No, I don't think I would mind. Nein, ich würde es nicht da uh, nicht uh, haben wollen, dass meine Reste wissenschaftlich bearbeitet werden. Auf keinen Fall möchte ich, dass mein Körper oder mein Schädel in einer Sammlung, in einem Museum ausgestellt wird. A long time ago, when I started to work with paleopathology. I started to talk to my students about this question. So we had this informal agreement. Maybe my bones are going to be in my laboratory there or at the university there. But I would have a question regarding uh, my family, my kids especially. So after I die, would it be important for them to have a graveyard to go to and to visit, to mourn? So I don't know, this I still have to discuss with them. I personally would not like that my skeletal remains would be researched by the next generation. Uh, wüsste ich, dass in ferner Zukunft mein Schädel, meine Knochen ähm, gefunden werden und ich dann dieses Material bin, anhand dessen man so tolle wissenschaftliche Erkenntnisse ziehen kann, würde ich mich freuen. Das wäre für mich ein sehr schöner Gedanke. Yeah, that's a little bit weird because I plan for myself. I want to be burned and just thrown somewhere in the woods or so. This is for physical anthropologists the worst case to study. We have to study these bones and they're very difficult to study. And so I'm not the real good person for future anthropologists. Auch wenn ich Auch wenn ich an, an, an meine Vorfahren oder Verwandten denke, würde ich äh, auch nicht wollen, dass äh, deren Reste beforscht werden. But I, I probably would want them back. If I knew that these were spiritual people, they were religious, or, and that they would have wanted to come home and be buried at home, I probably would want to do what their, their wish was. Jews have a concept of fod hamet, respecting the dead. That means that once a person is buried, they remain buried. You can change the headstone. You can come and visit the grave. You do not unearth the grave. Yes, how does a um, human remains or bones from a prehistoric individual come to the department. So in the beginning, the archaeologists find a graveyard. They have to dig it because there's a house building or a street building. Then this skeleton is brought to the museum. Um, it is cleaned. 
either by with normal tap water or by brushes depending on, on the soil and the importance of the skeleton. The first step of the scientists come in, they do an aging and sexing, they try to find out if it's a male, a female, a child, an old person. And we especially now focus on the paleopathology, which means we, we look for uh, diseases. We try to find out how this person lived, what he ate, um, if there's special treatment. When this is done, uh, a colleague of mine, he does the inventory, gets the skeleton, he gives them an inventory number, as usually in museums, all, all objects or subjects get an inventory number. Yes, human skeletons are persons. Science removes them from their contexts of origin through a series of particular processes. Items, remains, persons are removed from their, from their community where they are persons. They are washed, they are labeled, they are written on, they are packed, they are unpacked at the museum, they are categorized, they get put into museum accession books and online databases, they are photographed, they are depersonalized at every step of the way. And so by the time remains end up in museums, they have been scientifically translated or recategorized into not persons. And that, that is intentional. That is something science wants to do in order to compare like for like, in order to compare lots of crania or lots of skeletons or lots of evidence of osteoporosis or whatever the purpose of scientific research might be. In American Indian cultures, many people believe that there is a spirit associated with human remains and that those human remains represent human life. Therefore, those human remains do have human characteristics. They're from the past, they're our ancestors, but we still view them with respect and we also view them as deserving dignity, both in life and in death. So uh, I would say that uh, although personally, I do not b b see those ancestors as being like present-day human beings, but they are connected to us through history, through culture, through genetics. So uh, they are deserving of full treatment and respect as living beings. I would not consider the human skeleton as a person because in Jewish tradition, the very essence of a person is their neshama, their soul. And we believe that when a person dies, their neshama, their soul, returns to God. And that means that what is the remains is a, a evidence of a person's life, but it is not the person. It is still considered sacred and needs to be cared for very specifically. It was always for me a fascinating moment when um, bits and pieces of bones, of skull bones, came into my laboratory in, in, in Brazil and I opened <clears throat> the, the excavation box and I saw, well, okay, only bits and pieces. And then I washed the bits and pieces and when I then um, finished rec reconstructing the skull, it was always a very joyful and interesting and awesome moment to see, wow, there's somebody, somebody looking at me. I'm looking at somebody. So who was this person? Um, how did he live or she live? How old was she or he? Which kinds of diseases did she have? In which kind of um, social structure did, did he or she live? It is my job as an anthropologist, as a bioarchaeologist, to uh, make research and uh, on these human remains, on the skeletons, in order to reconstruct this individual's history so that 
we can then look at them as persons. Das ist für mich, ob äh, man Menschen foltern einfach. Und die sind gefoltert worden. Für mich ist es nicht ein Schädel, das ist ein Mensch. Für die Herero und Nama Community sind das Menschen, unsere Menschen, die sind hier gekommen, die sind hier entführt worden und die äh, Forschungen gefoltert und liegen immer noch hier in Kartons, in, 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 in Lagern, in Universitäten in Deutschland. Many people, when they think of Christian burials and their long-term curation, I've heard people say, oh, they shouldn't be in a box on a shelf, they should be in a crypt or in a vault, etc. Um, you know, so this is um, applying their particular religious perspective and particular religious practices to what should be done with these remains. I would look at it differently, for example, once we've excavated remains and we're looking at the long-term curation, they need to be kept and stored in an environment to ensure they don't further degradate because then we shouldn't have excavated them in the first place. So this is what I mean by a practical level of care. They should be stored in the right environment. They should be stored as individuals. We should minimize the chance of any remains being mixed up, for example. Then each every bone is um, numbered with this number, also the skulls. And eventually the boxes with the uh, bones from head down will come in a box down to the basement and the skull with the number on it will come to the shelves in the hallway. Nach afrikanischen Ritualen muss ich auch normalerweise, man kann keine Schädel ohne Körper äh, begraben. Uh, the separation of the skull from the rest of the bones is an, a tradition, actually. As in former days, they just collected the skulls. They never cared about the postcranial skeleton, so the rest of the body. Durch diese ganze brutale Politik sind wir gezwungen, diese Schädel irgendwie äh, eine, eine richtige Grab für alle zu, 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 zu begraben. Und das ist äh, leider natürlich ist sehr traurig darüber überhaupt so diese Art und Weise Menschen zu begraben, nur ein Schädel ohne Körper. Nowadays, especially for our research, the, the whole skelet, the whole body is very important. But with this heritage that we have more skulls than complete bodies, the skull is still separated and in these shelves. And there is another very practical reason, because the skull is very delicate and uh, rather big, and if you mix it with the bones, it could break easily. So we put it safely up in the shelves, and the bones are in a box down in the basement. Aber für uns ist spirituelles Akt, ja, dass man auch die auch äh, begraben soll oder muss. Wir haben keine andere Alternative. Es ist es besser natürlich, wenn die auch äh, eine richtige Ruheplatz finden wo sie finden können, wo auch wir alle einmal im Jahr dahin gehen können und uns mit dem auch äh, spirituell äh, mit dem zu unterhalten und sich auch zu, zu, zu begleiten in eine andere Welt. As humans, we do exist in a complex system of, of social and environmental interaction and the skeleton or well, the human body and the skeleton in particular record some of these interactions as a record. And this is really where human remains are the most direct record or evidence we have about past lives. But this is not just about the past, this is about the present and the future for us as well. Where do we come from? How did we come to be the way that we are? And what ideas and ways are there to, to um, to manage and create and live our lives for the future. The most promising uh, research avenue on osteological collections is molecular biology, I think. Especially because they are growing, um, there, there are more and more new methods of discovering more and more details about, about people. 
Ich glaube, dass es wird immer noch weiter geforscht. Das heißt, es wird immer noch weiter mit Experimente gemacht, was, wir, was ich auch nicht beweisen kann. Aber ich vermute, dass Deutschland immer weiter noch mit unseren Widerstandkämpfern, mit den Schädel hier noch weiter Forschungen gemacht. Und das kann man aber überhaupt nicht erlauben. And it's possible to, to make these um, molecular analyses without destroying um, the human remains significantly. So we can take probes and samples that are visually impossible to see because we, we can get, for instance, into the ear and then drill a little, little hole of, of a bony part that is inside there, so it's impossible to see, see it. It's important that the living communities of origin are actually asked for approval um, and support. It's not something that a lone scientist um, should be able to access our stolen remains um, for something that they think may be possible. And, that's, and it's all about a theory. And some theories have been proven to be wrong. And so you've taken this part of an ancestor, um, taken um, the essence and destroyed it. For what? Scientifically, it would be very important to, to maintain or to at least to study collections that are, that re represent communities that were not studied in detail, that represent um, um, communities or features that are unique. And if we don't study them, we might not even know if they are unique or not. We've got to ask, what kind of value would an indigenous community give to that research? So using Te Papa as an example for the Maori ancestors, if they've got 200 ancestors all gathered back together at Te Papa, they can do their own research. They don't need Western scientists to do research for them. By having all of the ancestors together, they don't need to do research that's destructive, so they don't need to take tissue samples. They can do observational research. They're able to do their own research, and it's meaningful research to them, not assuming that Western destructive type research is the only type of research that matters, the only kind of data that's valuable. There's lots of other kinds of data that are much more meaningful to indigenous communities. As a scientist, I think I'm naturally curious, and I think most people are naturally curious. And here is something that says, you know, oh, my tradition says this or that, you know. And sometimes you know, to, it, it helps to let science go in there and help us understand how we are, what we are, and how we became, where did humans come from, how did they travel around the world, who was where first, you know, and not what some tradition tells us, which people sometimes made up when they chewed or smoked peyote cactus, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe that sounds disrespectful. It's not meant disrespectful, but, you know, uh, there's many, many traditions, no matter if they are in Austria or, or elsewhere, that I feel like they have run their, their, their course, you know. This is... I, I don't do certain things anymore how my grandparents did it because life is different now and as long as it is based on mutual respect and not on judgment. Maybe the geographical practices of colonialism ended. Maybe um, Western societies are not in those countries anymore telling people how to behave and imposing their own morality on them but the attitudes of colonialism still exist. So the attitude that some indigenous communities cannot make their own decisions and have to be told what's good for them or what they are and aren't allowed to do with their ancestors, that's a colonial attitude, even if the politics of colonialism have been partially dismantled. The heart attitude, 
that doesn't see all people as equal, that doesn't want to be inclusive to people. Our museums and institutions do have those attitudes. So I think that's why examining colonialism and its legacy is really important. And we can't go back and change colonialism. We can't dismantle the history of colonialism, but we have got the privilege of dismantling the current legacy of it.